good evening and welcome to the third in our series of Light Conversations. Um, it's a very warm day in London today, so hopefully some of you have got something nice to drink as you watch us. So um, today we are having our conversation between Keith Bradshaw and Adam Scott, and we're supported by Igazini in our endeavours today. So a big thank you to our manufacturing partners, Igazini, for helping us uh, produce today's event. Please may I have the next slide. So my name's Emma and I look after the International Association of Lighting Designers in the UK and I'm aided in doing that with uh, Christopher Knowlton. There's a picture of us down at the bottom enjoying the uh, the lighting festival that happens down in Canary Wharf, which is great. Um, if you have any questions about lighting design or the association itself, please uh, contact me directly and I'll be able to help you with that. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have Keith Bradshaw, who's an ILD member and worked at Spears and Major, and Adam Scott, who's representing Free State today. Next slide, please. So what are we going to be talking about? I'm so pleased to have both, of, both people here um, for us today. Um, and they both share a lot of interest together, although if it was a Venn diagram, they're coming from two different bubbles and they're crossing over in the middle. So they've collaborated on um, several unique projects and I'm very much interested in hearing about those and how those shared experiences from their different backgrounds have, have come together with some amazing results. So I'm particularly interested in the dusk time economy and maybe what life might be like in the future after we've opened our, our cities and borders back up, open again for us normal citizens to enjoy life in our hate this word new normal. New slide please. So Keith uh, specialised in studying fine art before training and working up in architecture and has become hugely influential as a lighting designer. And I've known him personally for many a year now. So a big thank you for joining us and your breadth and depth of award winning projects stands you in good stead to um, help us today with your, your knowledge. So uh, thank you very much. Next slide, please. Adam's my new friend that I've met today, and he seems absolutely <laughs> wonderful. I'm really glad that we've got a, a, a matching beard combo going on today. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Um, thank you very much for joining us too, uh, Adam, uh, being the founder of Free State. And if anybody hasn't seen the small little video that they've got on their website, it's really great. Very um, ex explains fantastically what you do, and I would encourage people to go and watch that. Um, I'm very, very interested in, in what you do because the big thinking uh, concepts that come behind cityscapes and how we live our lives between social interaction and the economy are something that most designers have to uh, get, get their heads around all the time and concept work and so forth. So I'm really inter interested in listening to how the two of you have worked together uh, and the outcomes you've come to and what you think the future might hold for us. Slide, please. So please do ask your questions and I'll ask at the end. And now I'm going to hand over to our two speakers and I'll join you at the end. Great. Thank you, Emma. Hello, Adam. Hello, Keith. Um, I must declare an interest. Uh, Adam and I are friends. Um, and we've had several conversations like this before, um, usually not online, thankfully, um, and usually outside of pubs talking about various things. Um, we, um, the reason why I thought it would be really interesting to share a conversation uh, with everybody today is, is this, every time I, I speak with Adam about the way he approaches work and the way he talks about his work, there always seems to be a very, interesting kind of common vocabulary about um about you know the way we work with light as a kind of soft element of of, of architecture um adam really takes that to a different level uh, and in, and engages very quickly with things to do with light and other things that we'll talk about in a moment we've known each other for about 15 years we met here in uh, in blackpool which um was as just as romantic as it sound sounds um, what's interesting and was just, you know, although we've kind of gone off in our own different fields, 
we both initially studied to be architects, you know, professionals, grown-ups. Um, and, you know, one way along, along the way, we were kind of tempted into slightly more um, centric professions. Um, but what's, I think, fun about, um, and what's similar in, in, in the way we talk about work is, is there's words like um, experience, memories, certainly storytelling is something that, we, that always comes up when we talk about design. Um, and if, if it's not too, uh, too peculiar a word, it's almost like soft architecture, the, edge, the soft edges of architecture. That's, that's why I stopped being an architect and got involved in lighting. And that's why in a way, as I understand it from Adam, why he kind of fell off the wagon as well. And, and what Free State do is they, uh, they talk about the complete designed experience. So to start off, I wonder, Adam, whether you could just talk a little bit more about designed experience. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll have a go. I'll have a go. Um, I think critically for me, I think it's always the way the built environment is designed is the wrong way around. On the whole, what happens is there is a brief, you know, well worked out by a developer or a brand builder or a city maker. And then all of a sudden, the architects get involved and they think about the vessel, they think about the envelope, they think about the monument. And then everybody else then fills that vessel you know it's almost like you know it's a sort of a everything else is the overlay and what i think should be the diagram of choice is that firstly there's a brief that we well understand the needs the motivations the enthusiasms of our audience so the whole psychographic bit and then we imagine the ideal experience the moment by moment episodic narrative journey and then we think about all of the channels that are needed to bring that to life to inspire meaning and memory so that would be light and sound and architecture and hosting and technology and yada 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 all those things that create immersive experience so for me i talk about the design experience as a fundamental master plan and then everything else in an ideal world would follow and in that way, I think we'd create far better cities, far more transformative experience. And fundamentally, I think places that will grow and change because they wouldn't be beholden to the vessel. Uh, is that okay as an introduction? Uh, pretty strong, yep. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think that what's, what's, um, what's always kind of exciting for me as well when we talk, Adam, is that you're very kind of, um, I don't know, quite, it's, it's a form of empathy. And I don't know whether it comes from a kind of um, a very deep understanding of what people need from spaces and experiences, but it's the way that you seem to kind of understand the very subtle cues that, that, that kind of spaces need. Because um, the thing we were talking about most recently we were together, whenever that was, was about campuses, the different kinds of campuses that your work breaks down into. I thought it was a very neat way to talk about experience because I think in some you know we're you know we still as lighting designers have to explain to our parents and loved ones what we do for a living I'm sure you have to have the same kind of conversation with people near you but this idea of design around campuses was something which recently I thought was really neat yeah well, well thank you well I think uh, two bits to that then I mean firstly there's the empathy bit you said and and I think, you know, I've learned a lot, and I'm not just saying this because of the audience. I often talk about lighting designers, and I think as Emma was saying earlier, noting that, you know, a lot of, you know, people that you know come from a, a rock and roll background, a theatre background, where, you know, you're wearing black, you're standing behind a column, and you're carefully watching the audience to see what resonates, to see where they are, where they are, where they clap where they sigh. And I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by how we might learn from particularly from entertainment and hospitality to better empathize with our audience and then the second bit you mentioned the campuses so we split our work into three different types of campus so we have the transport campus which is uh, the um, the station station as catalyst for community and the airport we think about the commercial campus which is often run by workplace so that might be work for Nike or Google. It's that kind of idea of, of, of having a heart maybe built, built around a, a working hub, but then there's a whole clustering of other elements, of other amenities and types. And then the third one is the education campus, which is not just you know the university or the science park, but loving those places as a complex experience ecosystem to inspire great neighborhoods, great cities. So they're the three campuses, transport, commercial, and education. 
I think you know what 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 what's neat about that, and what I find really um, kind of understandable, palatable about that kind of, is that each of those types have a series of um, requirements, fundamental requirements about who they're for, what they're about, what the experience kind of might be. And what I think you know interesting is is the way that your work, in a sense, calls on whatever discipline is most relevant. So if it's mainly to do with an event or a brand moment, that's what you do. If it needs a bit of architecture, if it needs the help of an, uh, a sound designer or a service designer, you'll bring those in. So I think that in a way, it, it is in, in, in a sense architecture in its broadest sense, meaning that it's not just about the architect being the kind of the conductor of all the sub consultants it's it's the real kind of the genuine architecture of space because i think that a lot of people talk about having holistic views and macro views on things but it takes a certain kind of skill not to get stuck in the kind of the the nitty-gritty of of program and requirements and always remember what are we trying to do here who's this for there's a real skill to that well, thank you. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's also. I think we're only good at it now because of all the things we've fucked up along the way. Um, and I think you know a lot of that is because you know I think particularly being an architect by background, I don't get seduced by those big statements of you know who's pouring the most concrete or what's the most exciting facade. For me, it is the episodic bit. It is the moment by moment bit. And I think our projects have only gone wrong where we over egg one piece above another, you know, well, like even the work with Virgin Atlantic, there were so many bits that were going well. And yes, you know, there were moments with maybe the training of the staff or the not stepping forward from behind a work desk or the work with Sony where maybe we sort of overlit one piece and we found our audience constantly flocking towards that. Or we had sub base at the wrong moment, which meant everybody got distracted and went over here. You know, we've learned it because we, We've, we've over egged the composition and I think you know we've learned to uh, you know be much more balanced and listen very carefully to our audience and know that fundamentally whatever we design is always going to be to some extent ripped up on day one day two day three as we better learn and better understand and ideally can then tweak the experience to better resonate with them same yeah. as what you do yeah, I, well, I, in some ways it, it is, and I think that this is, in, in a sense, why we have this kind of uh, kinship, you could say, the, the similarities, not just physical, but also in the way we kind of talk about it. I think we talk a lot about uh, a kind of holistic approach to, you know, the night, effectively. We don't have control over everything, nor do we want control over everything. But it's interesting when you're trying to do a, an interesting piece of work or, or to, you know, draw a project in a certain direction. Uh, you have to have to be mindful of all the other influences on the people there, what they've kind of where they've just come from. You know, have they been on a, have they been on a, you know, in a in a transport campus before they arrive in a in a kind of commercial campus, as it were. Understanding that kind of that journey is really important. Um, I think what's what's interesting now, I think, and just to kind of bring this right up to date, I've been thinking about, you know, all all that we hear about. Um, people, proximity, um, the nature of being in public space together, it, it would seem that certainly in the medium term, being together would mean being outdoors a lot more. Yeah. You know, if, I don't know how you feel about that, whether, whether we, not that buildings are going to be less relevant and buildings are in many ways, large buildings are civic spaces, but, but it's interesting how feels to me that there's a lot to, of work to be done to make sure that outdoor space, the spaces in between buildings, is, 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 is well designed. Yeah. Because we're going to spend a lot more time in them. Yeah, I think you've cracked it. I mean, that whole bit before about talking about the journey, I think we are definitely incredibly uncertain about the role of destinations as we move uh, you know, into a post-COVID world. But the importance of the journey and how we stagger that journey, how we better understand that some of us will leave earlier, some of us will be later, some of us will be thinking of a working day that is much more peripatetic, you know, bounces from day to day, bounces into the evening. And actually, as, if we understand that journey more, if we design better with time, 
then I think those in-between times and in-between spaces are going to, as you say, become ever more critical. And so, you know, if I think about the university as an example, you know, rather than everybody being crammed into one lecture theatre, the opportunity of non-learning spaces, non-learning experiences, those gaps in between, where we can have more incidental study groups, where we can pick and choose where those tutorials begin, where those study sessions begin, and actually it can be much more informal, and we can opt in rather than being a, kind of it being pushed upon us, I think is going to be much more appropriate and how we can then use light and sound and, and, and you know, the beginnings of very kind of soft envelopes to begin to mark those, I think will be absolute fundamental. I mean, things like, I mean, just as you were saying that there, you know, you can almost a, a, an imagine a kind of a silent disco version of education, you know, where, where effectively by being in the right place at the right time, upon the right frequency, with the right QR code, that you'll learn something. And, and I think that, you know, the working day, the education day, is unlikely to be nine to five. Busy yeah. commute in the morning, busy commute in the evening. I mean, in the sense, I think that the, the opportunities or the change in the structure of the way we, we all can't be in the same place in the short term may have an impact on these things. I agree. I mean, I think you know, it's definitely true. I mean, for the university as an example, which is also true of the workplace to some extent, is that when we, when we come together, uh, and, 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 and not just for focus work, but for collaborative work, uh, students uh, have a better experience. Uh, they feel a greater sense of belonging. So national student uh, uh, survey results go up. They also get better grades uh, because of the competition and camaraderie. And they're more likely to meet their partner or business partner of their dreams because of the chance encounters that happen on campus. You know, a sticky campus inspires greater bump rate. So we're going to need to still make those campuses really rock. And I think that's why we're going to th have to think more about that staggered day and we're going to have to actually celebrate the live experience far harder than we ever did before. You know, no longer will that sort of lovely, you know, sort of, you know, sort of grandiose sort of medieval-esque architecture suffice and all the stuff that was stuck on the front of the prospectus. We're going to want to hear how this place is deeply attractive and constantly involving. And just one last point on that. I'm reminded that I think old ladies have cracked it, that whenever I take the train in from Sussex into London, it's always the old ladies after 10 o'clock. And it's not just cheaper then, it's also they have more room, they can go at their own pace, they can spread out, they can make the experience their own. And I think in many ways, we're all going to be learning from those old ladies. And that's why I think the staggered design philosophy will be much more relevant. Um, yeah. Anyway, I overdid yeah. that answer, sorry. <laughs> No, but you know, it was just just as we were talking earlier, thinking about all the things that kind of come into play in the project. Some of the things I've mentioned earlier on about yeah. program, service design, you know, as you call it, kind of curatorship and what have you. I mean, for the first time since the Middle Ages, um, hygiene, a sense of hygiene, is going to have an impact on how we use space, uh, yes. which I think is quite a remarkable thing. That, not that we haven't been thinking about it, but we certainly haven't been designing for it. It's a parameter yeah. that's kind of coming from less field. And I think that no matter how you know well we design the experience, if your proximity app is telling you something, you're going to go yeah. another way, you're going to avoid that public space. That's going to be a real challenge, I think, in the short term. I think that's really interesting. I mean, it 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 connects with the thing we were talking about before, where where some of the airport work we've done. You know the, the pillars I think of a great airport are firstly recognition, recognize your needs, then help people flow at their own pace, then give them choice on their own terms, and then maybe moments of inspiration. And I think you know what you're talking about there is you know those spaces in between where you know I want to recognize who's that they need recognizes me recognizes those people around me, helps me to flow, allows me to choose where I'm going to go and what is hygienic, what is safe, what is on my terms. And you can imagine how particularly I can see light and sound having a, a massive part to play in reassuring me about these spaces that previously seemed uncontrolled and insecure. As soon as you start to better animate them, I'm going to feel better recognized. I'm going to feel better that, you know, facilitated in the flow about my day. So yeah, I'm with you, 100%.
Yeah, it's interesting when they talk about the traffic light system, you know, of kind of red, yellow, ambers. I mean, that's a lighting system in a way, an immediate yeah. recognizable, you know, of, of, of risk. Green's for good, red's for stop and danger, and there's various degrees of amber. Yeah. And I don't know whether we're going to have to, we're gonna, you know, I don't literally mean there's going to be necessarily a traffic light system, but there might be something that, you know, you can imagine indicates risk through colour of light. Yeah, well, I, I love that. I mean, there's a brilliant chap at, uh, at, at UAL who, who developed a, a, an app called, I don't know if you've seen it, called Happy Maps. And rather than like Google Maps, it speeds you in the most sort of a efficient, effective way between A and B. He's created maps where you can choose the one that smells best or the one that's got the most interesting uh, environment or where you're most likely to bump into a friend. And I think you can imagine that kind of what you're talking about, about the color coding of how we might begin to opt in and opt out of different places, particularly the campus, which is, you know, owned and operated by often a, a singular entity, which lives or dies by how well it attracts and involves and creates a sense of belonging. So it is in their interest to better curate this. And also, I think, like, particularly great workplaces like Airbnb, you're not just um, curating and creating it as a top-down thing but you are co-hosting it co-designing it with the people and so it gets better for their involvement and I think we're going to see more and more of that yeah I just one kind of final thought um for me it's just a kind of uh, just I'm intrigued what you think about um travel and the nature of kind of the way in which we move around because I think yeah. both of us have kind of have really enjoyed the dynamic of working here, there, and everywhere, and kind of reacting to the different, you know, every time you think you've cracked it, there's something else comes along, whether it's a, a cultural issue or whether it's a kind of a, a demand you've never had before. And, I, and I've, I've certainly, in terms of a career, really enjoyed that. Um, I mean, I don't literally miss airplanes and literally miss airports and, and all of that, but I do miss being places. Um, mm. And I think being in the place is, is going to be easy to handle. I'm just not sure how we're going to get there, you know, in a kind of satisfactory way now. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that that's true. And so, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, the airport stuff we're looking at now is is about staggering, is about uh, booking your time so that you almost like have a VIP experience and you are, you know, your flow is facilitated in a staggered and stepped way. But, you know, obviously that that doesn't, that won't work at great scale. I, I'm also, you know, I'm sort of, must admit, I'm getting into, as we all will do, the idea of, you know, what I'm going to get out of my locale, how I'm going to, you know, create this as a hub for people to come to and vice versa. And so that we can, you know, allow those teams across the world to tell us stories and we listen attentively. And then we pour our energy into our locale and do great things here and share those stories. And so we are, you know, rather than, you know, a, a globalized thought, it will be, it's an internationalism and a localism. And I think, um, you know, both what you do and what I do, I think would probably benefit from that, you know, rather than us always turning up, it will be us better facilitating those leaders on the ground across the world. Uh, I yeah. look forward to that. Yeah. I wonder I evaded, whether that... question, I evaded your question. <laughs> But there's not an answer, is there, uh, at the moment? I think I think you know the, the the issue for me is I think in terms of the super city, you know, the unhygienic super city, yeah, um, which is kind of great and dynamic and vibrant and multi-layered. Uh, yeah, I read something yesterday about you know the move towards. I mean, I live in a small city. I live outside of London. I live in Edinburgh, and yeah. it's very easy to live here, even in these circumstances. In truth, because of the proximity to other people even though it's an old medieval city in many parts that was, was kind of congested, it's no longer congested in the same way. And yeah. part of the town planning of the new town was about space separation and more air and more views of skies and all that sort of stuff. So you can imagine how smaller cities in the, in, in the longer term will be more attractive yeah. than the super cities because everything's been about, certainly in the UK, everything has been pouring into to London for the last yeah. 150 years, hasn't it? Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, that's exciting, isn't it? And I think it's exciting for those edge places where whether it's 
and I, I've been thinking a lot about Croydon recently and Luton and places where, you know, as soon as you, you know, it, if, if, if there isn't such a cost of distance, actually, you know, actually we can do business, you know, meet extraordinary people, have wonderful experiences much more closely to home. And also, particularly if we're going to stagger that day and have some amazing kind of nighttime economy experiences, then they're more likely going to happen in, in places which are, you know, a bit cheaper, a bit more like Berlin, where things are more possible, where you're more likely to get an events license than what will happen in central London. And so I think that's exciting to see the innovation grow up on these edges and how those kind of, um, you know, sort of new urban centres, new agoras will grow. At, yeah, they're still going to be transport nodes, but they're not going to be, you know, the, the, the most expensive areas of real estate. And I think that's, that's ever so exciting. I like that for the sort of suburban centres. Yeah. I mean, normally in our conversations at this point, we've either somebody needs to go to get another drink or somebody desperately needs the toilet. So given that we're uh, in this reality, I wonder whether it's time that one of us went to the toilet or took a break. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, this is a time for questions. I, I don't know, Emma, what, what you think we should do. Uh, we could ramble on for hours and hours. I bet. <laughs> it's really I love listening to other people talking I feel like um you know I'm I'm in the garden and I can hear two neighbors nattering over the fence about you know this that and the other um I've always been very interested in what we used to call the customer journey or the customer expectation or in uh, as I was once told um the the path of desire when you walk around a building a property or yeah. a car park and I'm wondering now as Keith has said before um maybe those things have shifted a bit you know maybe this whole thing about hygiene is is going to be really front and center of everybody's minds now and where we where before we were designing everything to be as super efficient as possible to have as many people in one place to you know making mcdonald's chips all next to each other in very very small tight spaces that we're going to be kind of kinder to businesses and our whole experiences and recognize, you know, if we have these pandemics and we can all get very poorly very fast, that this huge push we had towards efficiency has actually been our undoing. What would you yeah. what would you say to that? Well, I I I I I mean I, I would like that to be the case. And I think in some ways that either not not so much efficiency being our undoing, but the the fact that a, a slower city, slower culture will mean that we reward you know the storytellers we reward the impresarios we reward the people who are going beyond the commodity and creating a genuine and transformative experience and so yes i feel that it's almost like over the next few months we need to gold plate those green shoots of opportunity so that then it can be an example to businesses in the same way that patagonia has been a fantastic example to businesses over the last few months about what they stand for and how they talk about their shared purpose. I want more of that, please. So yes, Emma. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So one question for, for each of you. What's been the best mistake you ever made? And by that, I mean, sometimes you design something, and it's happened to me in lighting before, and in your mind, you think it's going to work out one way, but actually when you take it on site and it gets used by the people or gets installed, it comes out in a completely different way, which was actually better than you thought it was going to be. Have you ever had that situation where your mistakes actually turned out to be not a good thing? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> we, we definitely have made mistakes for sure. Um, don't often talk about them, but yes, there's been a, there's been a few, I mean, I can the ones that spring to mind um, was a, uh, a bridge called the Infinity Bridge, which is a really beautiful bridge up in Stockton on Tees. And the the walking portion of the of the deck, it was a big double arch uh, reflected in the water to make the infinity sign. And uh, the, the, the deck was lit in um, blue, but as you walked across it, little tiny PIR sensors would trigger and it would fade up to white and then as you went it would fade down again so you had this beautiful kind of ghost there was a lovely kind of simple low-tech interaction and it became really popular and people were hanging out there and cycling across as fast as they could and 
and that was a real kind of that was a, that was lovely the way people started to kind of in, enjoy and interact and the bridge itself became a destination which which it, it was almost an early days of social media and we, we suddenly became aware that everybody was enjoying it the, the 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 mistake though i suppose was that not only were people enjoying it but also spiders so if you put a, a spider's web in front of a pir sensor and the wind blows and the wee spider just does that in front wow. you know we had all these complaints that oh it's not interacting the way it is and it turns out that when we investigated it it was the uh, overactive spider webs that were making the light trigger so that's quite fun <laughs> once we realized what the problem was that's very good i've given uh, you ages to prepare an answer for that all right. Well, no, I, I'm not sure mine is nearly so good. We, we did a project uh, called Electric Storm when we first came out of college. And you sure you want to talk about this? <laughs> no, I'm not going to go all the way. But what I what I am going to say is that basically we thought Photoshop was real because we'd never really done any big projects before. And so we thought that everything we could create on the computer was actually going to happen. And we had all these sensors that were weather sensors up and down the South Bank that would create high pressure mist across 500 meters and then they also had a sound and light installation that was attuned to the changing humidity and wind and water and blah 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 all this weather anyway uh, well, because we were being purists we thought that it would be best to just let the weather decide but actually the weather of course you know was doing dramatically changing crazy shifts throughout the day and it created this terrifying installation where you'd often have the sounds of sort of horses being garroted or sort of you know kind of electrocuted crowds and screaming uh, yeah lots of screaming horses i seem to remember and it scared the bejesus out of everybody because we um we'd let it be too pure it was too much of a an art event i suppose and not nearly well we hadn't listened to our audience who were mainly scared so that was a very bad mistake but we did learn a lot from it <laughs> Oh, Emma, I can't hear you. You can't hear me because I have my microphone on mute. That would be. Ah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that was a mum, a mum thing. Um, so uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's been wonderful to talk to you, and I'd very much like to invite you both to uh, talk again in the future, if that's possible. Um, uh, session has been recorded and we'll pop that up on YouTube in the next couple of days so if anybody couldn't watch they can watch later so it's a lovely sunny evening go outside and enjoy yourselves everybody and we'll see you next week for our next talk which will be between Mark Riddler from BDP and Jason Bruce from Jason Bruce Studios so thank you and good night thank you.